We have achieved soft landing on the moon. India is on the moon. Vindya's Chandrayaan 3 mission has succeeded. No country, no country has ever landed on this part of the moon. Space is a war fighting domain. US and China are clearly in a political competition here on Earth, so it should not be surprising that it has now also become part of the space. Increased activity from Russia, not just pushing against the alliance in air, land, sea, also in cyberspace. I think the space race is really between us and China, and we need to protect the interest of the international community. A Russian probe is expected to land on the moon's south pole any day now, in an area that could be critical for the future of exploration beyond the moon. Yeah is the first country in the world to land a spacecraft near the moon's south pole. The new space race is accelerating. Hi everybody, in the past three years we have seen some of the most sensational space events in the world. Elon Musk has been launching rockets one after the other, India has successfully landed on the moon, US is about to launch its first human mission to the lunar south pole in 2025 and even China and Japan are preparing for the same. But while most people might think this to be yet another exploration move, very few people realize that it has a geopolitical angle to it. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this. In November 2019, NATO declared space as one of the war-fighting domains. The United States launched the world's first independent dedicated space force. In the same year, France changed the name of its air force to Air and Space Force. And Russia combined its air force, anti-air and anti-missile defenses into the aerospace forces in 2015. So do you realize what's happening over here? Space is literally turning into a frontier of warfare. So all this drama is not just for scientific discovery, but also about having that extra advantage during the times of war. So the space race has a very, very significant geopolitical implication in the 21st century. So the question is, how did space turn into a frontier of geopolitical power? What are the most important points in space that different countries are trying to capture? Which are the most strategic points that the superpowers of the world are racing towards? What is the significance of these moon missions? And where does India stand in all this drama? Chalo, as usual, let's start from the basics and understand the space story first. The story of the space war started immediately after World War II with the US-USSR Cold War. This Cold War lasted from the end of World War II in 1945 till the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. This is when both the US and the USSR were trying to prove who was more powerful. And one of the many things that they were competing in was the space race. This is when on 5th of October 1957, USSR achieved the first successful satellite launch with Sputnik 1. And then in 1961, USSR sent the first human Yuri Gagarin to space. And the moment USSR announced this, the United States media and the leaders both got extremely insecure. Disaster and humiliation. These are the results of America's first attempts to get ahead of the space race. The day Soviet scientists jauntily drop-kicked the first Sputnik around the world, the average American was shocked, bewildered, and resentful. Americans were wary of Soviet intentions, fearful that this new technology would be used to launch nuclear weapons toward the U.S. Soon thereafter, President Dwight D. Eisenhower created the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. So that's when the United States was threatened by USSR's success in space and they decided to send the first human to moon. So finally in 1969, it sent Neil Armstrong to the moon. This is how the space race began. So do you realize it was not about finding anything important or discovering something crazy, but simply a political show off. This is when finally the USSR broke into several parts, modern day Russia was formed and the cold war came to an end. The Soviet Union itself is no more. This is a victory for democracy and freedom. It's a victory for the moral force of our values. For your deepness, I am ceasing my activities in the post of President of USSR. The tricolor banner of the Russian Republic now flies over the Kremlin. 
In Eastern Europe, satellite countries were freed. He even allowed the Berlin Wall to fall. I'd like to express on behalf of the American people my gratitude to Mikhail Gorbachev. But by the end of this war, the United States realized that if not then, someday space will be of utmost importance. Because if you look at the trend of warfare, earlier it was just about land. And then the Brits and the French used oceans to become the rulers of the world. And then with both the world wars, air became a frontier of warfare. And post world war, there were two more frontiers of war that got defined, cyberspace and space. And the United States realized that just like the Brits and French capitalized on the ocean when nobody was serious about it, when nobody was serious about space, if they understood the space better, they could get far ahead during war times. So if you see this graph, NASA's budget dropped drastically after their moon landing. But even after that, it kept on growing with time. So this meant that NASA was very serious about space. And not just NASA, but many countries across the world have been working on their space projects for decades. And you will be stunned to know that space travel has become super, super cheap now. If you look at this chart, the cost of space travel after SpaceX has reduced significantly. These are the prices that are expressed in FY21 dollars and each of these circles indicates the cost per payload to launch heavy vehicles into the low earth orbit. Here if you see, in 1965, it used to cost more than $8200 per kg to launch a spacecraft into the low earth orbit. But after the launch of Falcon 1, the cost has decreased drastically and Falcon Heavy cost only $1500 per kg. That's a 5x decrease in cost. And if reports are to be believed, then the SpaceX Starship could bring down the cost to less than $1000 per kg. And in the next 20 years, the cost of space transportation is expected to fall to less than $500 a kg. This is the reason why every other company and country is gearing up to control the space. Now the question we hear is, how can you control the space? I mean space is infinite, right? Then how can countries become powerful by launching spacecrafts? Well, as it turns out, although space is infinite, there are some very, very important points around Earth that are crucial for space control. And the country that understands, explores and captures these points might get way ahead in the space race of the 21st century. So the question is, what are these points and why are they important? Well, the first category of points around the Earth lie in these three zones. Here we have the low Earth orbit, the middle Earth orbit and the geosynchronous and geostationary orbits. The low Earth orbit is typically at an altitude of less than 2000 km, but it could be as low as 160 km above the Earth's surface. This is the closest zone to the Earth and it is used to place spy satellites to get high resolution imagery. And since they are closer to Earth, you can have satellites at a cheaper cost and can even be used for high speed internet. This is why even Starlink satellites are placed in low Earth orbit. And then we have the medium Earth orbit located between 2000 km and 35,786 km. This altitude allows satellites to cover large portions of Earth while providing precise positioning data. This is the reason why America has its GPS, Russia has its GLONASS and EU has its Galileo satellites placed over here. And then you have the last orbit which is the geostationary orbit at 35,786 km above the Earth's surface. Now the beauty of this orbit is that satellites placed in this orbit will move exactly at the same rate as the Earth rotates. So if a satellite is placed over a point on Earth, that point will always remain parallel to the satellites while the Earth rotates. So if someone wants to monitor a specific point on Earth for a long duration, this orbit is the place to be. And do you remember, the United States once caught India during its nuclear test. This operation was known as Operation Shakti and the US spy satellites that detected the operation were present in the geostationary orbit. These are the three orbital zones in space that are used by the US and other countries for communications, internet and spying. And this brings us to the second category of important points in space, which are Lagrange points. These are special points in space where the gravitational pull at these points from both bodies balances out. For non-science students, if you've placed an object in space, it will get attracted to a large space body. So if you place anything in between the moon and the earth, it will get pulled by the gravitational pull of the moon and the earth. But there is one point between the moon and the earth where the gravitational pull of both these bodies is exactly the same. So if you place something over here, the object will remain here without drifting towards the earth or the moon. So this point where both forces equalize is known as the Lagrange point. Lagrange points are 
places in our solar system where the gravitational pull of the planet and the sun and the motion of the orbit combine to create an equilibrium. Objects that are sent to these locations in space either tend to stay there naturally or can be kept there with minimal energy. There are places in our solar system where objects can orbit the sun at the same speed as the planet, staying in the same place relative to both of them. In total, there are five Lagrange points, L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. L1 is the point where the solar observation satellites have been positioned to monitor the sun without any interference from the Earth or the Moon. So if you see the diagram, even while the Moon revolves around the Earth, it does not hinder the view of the sun. So L1 provides real-time solar data which can disrupt power grids, satellite operations and communications on Earth. So it's basically an early warning zone that can allow operators to take precaution. L2 is used for astronomical observation satellites because it offers an unobstructed and stable view of the outer space and it's close enough to readily communicate with the Earth. This is where we have the James Webb Telescope which is a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. And then we come to L3. As of now, L3 hasn't seen any practical utilization because it is on the other side of the sun. Similarly, L4 and L5 also do not have any significant applications that we could find. And all we know is that they are great parking spots to park objects to observe the space. So just like the Earth's orbits are observation points for the Earth, Lagrange points are observation points for the sun and outer space. And this brings us to the third type of the important space point, which is the moon itself. And this is where India, Russia, Japan and the United States moon race comes in. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. The first to send a man into space. In the galactic race of global superpowers, Russia once led the way. Man's dream and a nation's pledge have now been fulfilled. The lunar age has begun. It is a historic day in space. India has become the first country to reach the south pole of the moon and the fourth country to ever land on the moon. To put that straight, Moon has three important resources that could eventually prove to be a game changer in geopolitics. The first resource is water ice, which is particularly found at the South Pole. This water ice is extremely valuable because water can be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen, and these elements can be used for breathing air and more importantly, as rocket fuel for space missions. So the country that cracks this code will be able to transform the moon into a refueling station for deeper space exploration. And the scary fact over here is that lunar water is not a renewable resource like the water that we find on Earth. It will be extracted on a first come first serve basis. So time is the essence for this resource. The second resource that we have is Helium-3 and this is a game changing resource in itself. It is available on Earth in very limited quantities and it is used for a variety of purposes including cryogenics, quantum computers and even for medical purposes. And the fun fact is that Helium-3 can be used to generate fusion energy to provide a limitless and clean source of energy without radioactive waste. And the moon is the biggest source of helium-3. This is the reason why governments are interested in extracting helium-3 from the moon for fuel supply. So if any country manages to crack this, it could be a game changer for that country. And lastly, there are rare earth elements. Now it's not like the moon has more rare earth elements than earth, it's just that they're more easily accessible on the lunar surface. These rare earth elements are crucial for a wide range of modern technologies including electronics, renewable energy systems and many advanced defense applications. So whichever country masters moon landing, moon exploration and moon resource extraction will have a huge advantage as compared to other countries. This is the reason why India, China, Russia, Japan and even the United States are spending so much money on launching a moon mission. And right now, India has made an extraordinary landing, China has plans scheduled for next year and the United States aims to land astronauts on the moon's south pole by 2025. So now, what remains to be seen is, who builds the most economical method to get to space? Now this will come from a ton of R&D in the private space companies. So the second question is, what are we doing to build an ecosystem for space industry in India? And lastly, the question that we need to ask the government is, what are the government policies that are preparing India to capture the space in the 21st century? 
This is the history, importance and the geopolitics of the space race of the 21st century. And I just hope you learned something valuable from this case study. That's all from my side for today guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.